Um, I am, a, as you said, an ENT um, surgeon. So I put myself forward to do this actually, because I think it's really important that we have a, um, to have an ENT input into head and neck reconstruction. Um, certainly for um, exam knowledge, you know, it's rather a niche topic for that. It's not, a, not commonly brought up. Um, and I'm gonna be focusing on uh, reconstruction pertinent to head and neck oncology uh, mainly rather than uh, local uh, facial plastic flaps, which I'm sure is covered in another talk and, and a slightly commoner um, topic to get asked in these sort of things. Uh, I know often people say, I'm not gonna mention the exam and then end up talking about the exam on every slide, but uh, I will try and make things pertinent both to um, that format as well as just day-to-day -day knowledge and, and having an input into the MDT with um, head and neck cancers and reconstruction. Uh, so objectives of this session um, are to um, understand the main principles of head and neck reconstruction um, from an ENT point of view, um, to gain awareness of the common workhorse flaps in head and neck, uh, and to be aware of the current best evidence for laryngectomy reconstruction. I'm going to focus on that in the final third, just, just regarding laryngectomy reconstruction, because I think it's an area where, where uh, hopefully as ENT surgeons, we can um, definitely have a, a, an important input into um, the best uh, methods of reconstructing those large defects. Um, just as disclosure, I'd just like to um, thank uh, Harry Gerardian and Carissa Thomas, who were two of my mentors in Alabama. Um, for some of the photos and slide contributions to this, so uh, many thanks to them. Uh, from a reconstruction point of view, obviously as a, as a, as a specialty, um, reconstruction, specifically uh, plastic surgery, um, goes back um, to, you know, to over 2,000 2, years ago with some of the Sanskrit texts. Um, but when we're talking about um, a huge advent in head and neck reconstruction, we're really talking about microvascular surgery and the huge uh, range of uh, operations that has allowed us to do, because um, as we create bigger and bigger holes, it's allowed us to um, fill those with both a, a safe and functional reconstruction. With head and neck oncology, those two things, safe, uh, safety and function are really the the paramount factors, uh, but as microvascular experience has grown, especially with our plastics and uh, maxillofacial colleagues, um, aesthetic uh, factors are an important factor to consider as well. Uh, although the first two features um, sh must and should be paramount in the decision making. Um, when I mention our colleagues, obviously we're all trying uh, to achieve um, the perfect teamwork in these cases and um, well, I'm not a Ferrari fan I think this uh, epitomizes teamwork perfectly uh, and it's really important from the moment the patient is presented at the MDT that both um, an ablative uh, plan and a reconstructive plan is considered um, and rather than just having a, an input on what needs to be taken out um, it's important that we consider reconstructive options as well, um, because it's important from the very first conversations with the patient uh, regarding um, expected treatment and consent uh, through to managing them postoperatively and in their follow-up. I think the goals for an ablative surgeon are fairly clear. Obviously, we need to remove the cancer with a safe margin, uh, but there are important as other aspects to consider as well. Um, we need to help microvascular colleagues um, with preparing the defect that's going to accept the flap in the best way possible um, and ideally find vessels for them. Um, no um, uh, reconstructive surgeon is going to thank you if um, you've taken um, vein stumps at the IJ or unless it's necessary from an oncological point of view. Um, and it's important to appreciate some of the important aspects of reconstruction. Um, and when I say that, I'm talking about tissue handling, uh, especially related to the vasculature, 
Um, so as I say, it's important to, to give your reconstructive surgeon some options if it is oncologically safe to do so. That means not handling vessels uh, in a uh, rough manner, not using tooth forceps um, you know, to grab um, a whole vessel, treating everything with respect. Um, if you can, and, and hopefully the, the purpose of talks like this is to just gain some appreciation of um, how defects might relate to donor vessels and what would be the best arrangement um, for the reconstructive surgeon once they've raised the flap to be able to, to inset things. Um, and um, ulti ultimately, as you get more experience with that, you can have an input into choosing the best vessel um, in terms of caliber and length as well. Informed consent with reconstruction is a really interesting one. I think, I think that's why it's really important that um, ENT have an, a good knowledge of reconstruction because, um, I mean, informed consent is, a, is an interesting topic. If you look at some of these, you know, massive surgeries, um, that we, how can you really give informed consent for that? Um, and it's important to manage patient expectations regarding this, the emphasis on clearing cancer, the emphasis on creating a, a safe wound, um, a, a functional result, um, and aesthetics as much as you can. Uh, but the patient needs to have an appreciation of what um, this reconstructive procedures will involve, uh, the fact they may be um, prone to complications, uh, the fact they may not be able to swallow and be gastrostomy dependent. So all these kind of factors are important that are brought up early with the patient so that they um, have an appreciation of what their recovery is going to involve. Uh, this uh, meme was actually on the wall in uh, the residence room in, uh, uh, in the US and I've decided I'm going to try and put it into every talk I ever do uh, just because it makes me laugh but uh, it is very pertinent that it's no good having a, a really attractive flap um, if the main purpose of it in terms of separating um, the upper digestive tract with the neck is not working properly um, because that will soon present itself very quickly and what may have looked like a very neat wound um, because of meticulous external suturing uh, will break down into a horrible mess and anyone who's done enough cases will know what that looks like uh, so it's important to get the fundamentals right of what you're doing with um, reconstruction. The reconstructive ladder is something having said I won't mention the exam is something you need to have on the tip of your tongue for the exam to just it's just one of those automatic uh, driving test things that you have to come out with straight away um, and know the steps involved. Um, but in reality, um, it's actually um, a slightly outdated concept um, because now it's all about a multidisciplinary 360 assessment of the patient in terms of um, disease factors, patient factors, um, defect, anticipated defect, function, uh, resources available, um, and, and patient wishes as well, um, certainly where there's um, a few options um, to consider. Um, so rather than just going up a ladder, um, it's important to have this um, global view of how you're going to approach the reconstruction of a defect. Um, and and the, the, the well-known saying is the right reconstruction for the right defect for the right patient. Um, if you've got um, something wrong with that, there's no point in, uh, in trying to make things pretty at the end because you need to get the fundamentals right uh, for that. And that means if you've, got a, if you've got a defect, repairing it properly, and then you can um, do anything you like to tweak and make it aesthetically pleasing as possible, but you need to get the basics right. Uh, with reconstructing the defect that the ablative surgeon has created. Um, so simplifying reconstruction is important as well. Um, the days of having patients on the table for you know, 18, 20, 24 hours have gone. Uh, we appreciate the importance physiologically of expeditious surgery. Um, creating, a, as I keep saying, uh, I think it's important to emphasize a safe and functional result. Um, defects like this um, could be reconstructed in multiple different ways, um, but um, 
you know, if you consider um, the safe, a safe workhorse flap like the radial uh, forearm flap, um, carefully plan how you're going to fill a soft tissue defect, um, then in one surgery, um, you can um, create a safe wound. And, and sometimes it's, it's very obvious of when to use a, a free flap. Um, and a lot of this talk is around free flaps because um, as I say, that's become the major reconstructive method for head and, major head and neck uh, oncology. You know, defect like this where you've got, you've had extensive resection, lateral temporal bone, a large defect, large amount of um, skin loss. It's clear you're gonna need a large amount of tissue and the ALT is perfect for that good color match, um, nice safe wound. But sometimes it's not always clear. Um, so you could use a uh, free flap in this patient. Um, can't see the rest of them, but um, cons consider there may be comorbidities. And actually there are other options. So you can use um, some of these modern acellular dermal matrices uh, products. Um, and if you put that on, um, then you can often create a nice, healthy, granulating wound base that will accept a skin graft. Uh, so um, it's all about having lots of tools of, at your disposal um, and applying the best uh, tool possible uh, to create a safe and functional result. And these are the important things to consider. We've mentioned you know, patient factors, disease factors, and local, local in terms of logistics. Um, I think, uh, it's important to mention logistics actually because although the first two are the, are the most important it is important to, to know um, what the expertise of your teams are um, you know you need to work within an MDT you need to work with microvascularly trained colleagues um, and if you don't have those expertise available and a free flap in a certain case is uh, the best reconstruction to use then they should the patient should be referred to somewhere where that skill is available so um, that is important. In terms of patient factors, this is all about having a 360 degree of the patient. So comorbid disease, do they have peripheral vascular disease? Uh, what's their performance status? What's their comorbidity index? What's their mobility like? <clears throat> have they been in any tra traumatic accidents before um, that may affect which donor site you choose? Um, do they walk with a stick, which, which is their dominant hand? There's no point taking a donor site from a, um, uh, an arm, uh, for example, where someone is reliant on that for, a, for, for walking with a walking stick. So all these things are really, really important to consider. And disease factors is um, self-explanatory in terms of choosing um, the right size and um, tissue uh, to reconstruct the defect. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna go through some of the um, workhorse flaps now um, and there's no uh, better place to start for that than uh, the pec major and I'm sure we've all had experience hopefully of, of that and if you haven't do try at some point during your training because um, it can really get you out of a lot of trouble. Um, some of these pictures I've taken from the um, open atlas um, collated by um, uh, Jan Fagan, it's a fantastic uh, resource, so I really would recommend it. Um, so the PEC major um, it is based on um, the pedicle of the pectoral branch of the thracoacromial. Um, you can outline the pedicle by drawing a line from uh, ziphy sternum to acromion and the bisection of that line from the midpoint of the clavicle. Um, there are various different incisions described. Um, a common one in, in males is to arc over here. There's a, a classic description of a defensive incision where you're trying to not uh, violate the classical delta pectoral flap. Um, in reality, that's very rarely used. Uh, nowadays, I actually haven't seen it used. Um, so many institutions. Um, incision up to the clavicle to make the 
raising of the flap as easy as possible. It, it is an easy flap to raise. It can either be a uh, myocutaneous or, or myofascial flap, depending on what you're using it for. Um, lift the pec major off of the, separate it from the pec minor, and then rotate it up into the neck. And in reality, um, uh, it can reach fairly high. Um, wouldn't go above the ear with it because that will really put tension on the wound and be liable to break down. Uh, but certainly for um, neck skin, um, laryngectomy defects, um, and it can even be used in oral, although there are often better alternatives now. Uh, but in a patient where you need a quick solution, um, then it can get you out of a lot of trouble. Um, supraclavicular iron flap is another option. This has kind of fallen out, had fallen out of favor a little bit um, in the past decade, couple of decades. Um, initially, um, as many flaps were, um, designed for, for burns, uh, defects. Um, and there was initial concern about uh, uh, reliability, uh, but actually um, in, in the hands of people who do many of them and many units are, use, are using this regularly, um, it's a very reliable, safe flap and very fast to raise. Um, and um, it's important to um, preserve um, the supraclavicular ped pedicle here um, as you approach um, the uh, sternocleidomastoid and, and the jun junction of the um, external jugular with the clavicle. Um, and once you stay uh, subperiosteal over the clavicle, um, you can see here checking the Doppler signal of the pedicle. This can then rotate up and you can actually um, close some wounds with uh, both uh, external skin or, or indeed internally on the pharynx. You can deepithelialize the middle of the flap um, and actually you get a, a reasonable cosmetic result in a, in a safe flap and again a quick one to raise. Uh, so when we're talking about free flaps um, there are some other things to consider um, and vessel Geometry is very important with this um, and selecting the right vessel. In reality, a lot of these decisions can be made um, or are enforced depending on the extent of the resection, um, what vessels needed to be sacrificed and how they lay with that particular patient. But especially when you're doing salvage surgery, um, then scarring, deformities, etc., can um, dramatically affect how a vessel will lie. And it's important to consider if you do have them in a slightly unnatural position for the surgery, um, then when the um, head is neutral, um, which they will be in the post-operative stage to make sure uh, that the vessel is not gonna be kinked. Um, issues around uh, tracheostomy are really important. Obviously, you don't want any ties around the neck. Uh, it's really important that um, if you spot this on your post-operative ward round, it's immediately corrected, uh, although hopefully in units that are doing flaps now, um, this, these issues have been ironed out. <clears throat> but you don't want any compression around the pedicle, especially um, if you are have, if, you know, su the supervisual venous system has been used um, for venous anastomosis. Um, atherosclerotic disease can often play a part. Hopefully this has been anticipated in your preoperative workup. Uh, but if you do find this clinically, um, you may need to consider, you know, which side of the neck to use, if you've got both sides open, or indeed, um, if you've got severe atherosclerosis, whether you should make an interruptive plan for um, avoiding microvascular anastomosis. Um, and the size of vessels, although um, mismatch can be dealt with um, with various technical modifications. Um, if you are in theatre and your ablation's finished as a trainee, I think it's really important that you at least spend some time watching microvascular anastomosis. Um, <clears throat> it's usually on the TV screen for the microscope, so it's easy to watch. It's quite relaxing. There's usually music playing, depending on <clears throat> the surgeon's choice of music, maybe relaxing. Um, there are various techniques and ways of doing this, and I won't get bogged down in the technicalities of it. Uh, but essentially, um, despite what people say, there really isn't any evidence that uh, one way is better than the other in terms of patency. Uh, um, 
important things that the sim does what they have been trained to do and what works in their hands um, and it's whichever technique you use it has to be um, technically proficient uh, because uh, the prime reason for a flap to fail without doubt is technical error <clears throat> um, and veins have been made nice and, and straightforward with the um, venous coupler device which again you should see using or get involved with helping if you can um, and that's made uh, venous anastomosis pretty speedy um, main issues are to ensure that um, veins are not twisted um, <clears throat> or kinked and uh, that this is done uh, accurately and not placed near a, um, a valve that may affect uh, blood flow and promote thrombosis a variety of perforator flaps have been described now. Um, again, although most of these are used in different specialties um, <clears throat> for ENT and specifically soft tissue defects, um, radial forearm free flap um, and LT uh, are by far the commonest flaps used. Uh, although rectus flap is also provides a good amount of um, uh, bulk if you've got large defects um, and latissimus dorsi similarly for its scalp defects those sort of things are also worthwhile considering <clears throat> so um, for radial forearm flap this is really again from a free flap point of view this is the workhorse um, based on the radial artery and the veni comitantes of that um, with or without the uh, cephalic vein um, although Again, um, reviews suggest that there's no real uh, huge benefit from including this within the flap. Um, and this can be modified um, to a great degree. Um, your, the amount of um, tissue you can take to reconstruct, reconstruct defects is actually quite significant. Um, the, the reason that um, some people don't like him are because of um, the donor site morbidity in terms of healing of a split skin graft, although there are, again there are modifications to um, minimize the use of split skin grafts. Um, because if it doesn't take, you do and you, you may have exposed tendons, which is not only unsightly but can cause functional issues as well. Um, but generally, um, with a reasonable size defect um, and appropriately performed skin graft and dressing and post-operative care, um, these heal up very well. It's ideal for, for oral reconstruction with the tongue and floral mouth, although um, obviously that uh, generally is um, the max fax management, um, but certainly for partial pharyngectomy defects, um, specifically patch flaps, it's again um, very suitable thickness and pliable tissue to be able to do a very accurate inset um, on various other um, reasons for using it as well um, and there can be various ways of modifying it as well in terms of um, clever ways of reconstructing defects. Uh, ALT um, is the other workhorse for ENT um, based on um, the descending, um, actually descending circumflex artery um, and the perforators passing between latus lateralis and rectus femoris. Um, now, um, this flap is designed just briefly from drawing a line from the anterior superior iliac spine um, down to the supralateral border of the patella. Um, <clears throat> and in general, your main perforator you will find uh, about 1.8 centimeters behind that line at the midpoint and within a three centimeter circumference around that. So when you see um, microvascular colleagues drawing all these lines over legs that's what they're looking for and then trying to hunt for with um, Doppler signals and then there'll generally be one or two other perforators in close proximity within about five centimeters of that mark. The ideal thing with ALT flaps is that they can you can start raising these before you know the size of the defect um, because really once you've made your medial incision um, you can um, then modify the size of that based on the defect you have. Um, you may have to do a perforated dissection if it's traveling through your muscle. Um, if it's a septocutaneous perforator, then you're in luck because it makes it a lot more straightforward. Um, 
<clears throat> you also have innovative flaps. Um, <clears throat> if you take it, um, you know, sensory nerve, you can do this. And there's some research doing that, looking at um, oral or pharyngeal reconstruction, whether you take a sensate um, flap is functionally better. Uh, the rectus we've mentioned um, based on the inferior epigastric, um, and that gives you a large bulk of muscle, uh, but more, less commonly used. Uh, I'm going to skip over some of the, the bony flaps as they were in there, just more for interest. Um, but know that, that you can include um, uh, uh, an osteocutaneous um, flap within your radial defect if you take a segment of the distal radius. You can actually take up to 10 centimeters and osteotomize it once, some twice, but generally once. Um, and although, again, this has fallen out of favor a little bit, it can get you out of a, um, uh, a hole very quickly as it's, again, very quick to raise and uh, a very reliable flap. Skip through these. Uh, and fibula is kind of the workhorse, for, obviously, for um, the maxillofacial mandibular defects that need reconstruction. Um, <coughs> important flaps to be aware of, but um, Obviously, that comes more under the maxillofacial team. Um, so, I'm going to spend the last bit of this talk just look, talking a little bit about the evidence for laryngectomy reconstruction because it's really important from an ENT point of view. Um, and most of the evidence for this and the, the necessity to know about it is because um, following the VA study and the RTOG 9211 study, um, essentially chemoradiotherapy has become an important upfront treatment uh, for advanced um, laryngeal tumours, um, meaning that we see these cases uh, when, if uh, patients fail that treatment, and the treatment has uh, some important uh, impact on um, the recovery uh, of these patients and their ability to heal. Um, and various studies have shown um, that the fringocutaneous fistula rate um, in salvage laryngectomies um, can be anything from 15 or so percent through to 60 percent. Um, and if you chat to any of your experienced um, head and neck consultants, um, they will be able to tell you about you know, episodes of trying to manage these wounds on the ward. Um, with significant fistulas following attempted primary closures. Um, and there's about two, two by three times increased risk of a fistula among patients who have received <clears throat> primarily chemo radiation prior to laryngectomy. Um, so the evidence for using vascularized tissue, um, not, not specifically with a uh, pedicle or free flap, but there is clear advantage with bringing tissue in um, these are the kind of wounds you can get if um, things break down and this, even when you use vascularized tissue. So uh, this was a, <clears throat> a radial forearm flap, I think, that the um, patient was vomiting soon after uh, surgery and about day three or four intractable vomiting that wasn't uh, responding to antiemetics and uh, the whole wound broke down and you can see the open pharynx there. Um, the black arrowhead shows you the pedicle of the flap, um, and the white is the kind of mastoid end. Uh, but they do heal eventually. Um, one of my old bosses used to say 40 days and 40 nights. Um, that's actually probably far more accurate than we thought, <laughs> than we, uh, we thought at the time that he was plucking numbers out of the air. Um, but the first thing is to make the vessels safe. Um, you want saliva sitting around the um, great vessels, and then it's to allow the wound to mature that it will accept um, uh, a secondary reconstruction if it needs it. And this patient had a, a pec flap um, to um, repair uh, and cover the vessels. On that right side, where you can see they're exposed, on the left, actually, um, we used an SCM flap at the time of surgery to cover those vessels, uh, which uh, I is a very good technique to use. Um, and there's three general categories for, and this is any, any laryngectomy, you know, 
primary laryngotomy case. Um, the primary closure. You've got cases where you've got sufficient mucosa to close primarily, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the second where you've got uh, mucosa present, but it's not sufficient to be able to close it primarily. And those where you had to sacrifice um, circumferentially mucosa, so you've got a total laryngopharyngectomy defect. So how much is sufficient mucosa? Well, um, this is uh, quite a famous study um, from 96, where they looked at and measured um, the amount of mucosa left um, and looked at the subsequent um, results from that repair. And actually, um, they, they, the range of um, remnants left uh, were from at the least 1.5 centimeters relaxed. Um, important to stress that's relaxed and that was about 2.5 centimeters stretched. Although they only had one patient who was at that level. So I think most people would consider that some um, stretching things. Sorry, that's not a deliberate pun. Um, most, I think most units I've worked at kind of three centimeters stretched would be a, would be a minimum. Um, otherwise you are. Um, risking a um, subsequent dysphagia and, and uh, uh, necessity for further procedures to help me swallow. Uh, so certainly pectoralis major can be used very effectively for these defects. That can be either in an onlay technique, uh, primarily where you've got, um, you haven't included a cutaneous portion of the flap and you can just lay it over a primary repair. Um, if you haven't got the option of a free flap for whatever reason, uh, because of patient or logistics, local expertise, etc., then you can use a myocutaneous flap and, and inset the skin. Um, although we'll talk a bit in a minute why about why this is not always an ideal option. Um, and this was an um, uh, important study um, to look at. The difference is um, actually one of the only ones really to important studies to look at separating a pec overlay flap and a, and a free flap from 2013. Um, and, and they showed uh, that um, using either a pec trailer's major overlay flap or um, bringing in a free flap um, in salvage laryngectomy um, significantly reduced the fistula rate from primary closure. Um, there wasn't a significant difference uh, between uh, the pec and the free flap, although the duration of the fistula um, was less in the free flap group. When you have sufficient mucosa, um, you haven't needed to create a circumferential defect, but you have had a, sal a, la a salvage laryngectomy, um, then you're talking about in setting some vascularized tissue and a radial forearm is ideal for this. Um, it's very nice pliable tissue. It's very easy to create a very nice inverting suture line um, and give both wound edges that you've left uh, vascularized tissue in which to promote healing. Um, ALT um, is better for when you've got slightly larger defects um, and certainly um, better when you've got circumferential defects. Um, here's an LT we did with a, um, a nice vessel configuration and a muscular dissection with muscular perforators here. Um, and the advantage with the LT is you can um, take the fascia um, much wider than the skin defect you've got to allow you to wrap, um, use the fascia as a, se a separate layer uh, to reinforce the closure. So that's one of the benefits of the LT, although there are ways of, of modifying the radial flap to be able to do that as well. Um, the other advantage it gets, and this is dependent on local anatomy, so if you have a favorable uh, perforator anatomy, you can create um, you know, chimeric flaps um, to be able to, if you do need it, for example, if you have lost a significant amount of skin, um, as well as having a pharyngeal defect, then you can um, use this to fill both defects. Obviously, we tend to have um, implantable Dopplers now um, in, so in most units I've worked at, so the necessity to have an external skin paddle monitor has, has significantly reduced. Uh, but that's one other 
people sometimes have a, a skin paddle separate as well. Um, Vip Hilary in 2014 really amalgamated a um, Avengers-like um, cast of um, head and neck um, surgeons from around the world to produce this really important paper um, looking at almost 600 patients um, and salvaged total laryngectomy um, with a, and their combined fistula rate was 26%. Um, the patients who underwent flap um, reconstruction uh, had a significantly reduced fistula rate compared with the primary closures. Again, corroborating that uh, earlier study. And the number needed to treat uh, was estimated uh, to be 11 uh, patients. Um, and the risk of fistula foreign primary closure overall was about 50% higher than when using vascularized tissue. Um, the problem with all the re reconstructive literature is, is that it is all retrospective and it does tend to combine flaps. Um, but you know, the reason is it's very difficult to design a prospective study um, to look at this because of the inherent case bias um, when you're trying to select the appropriate flap for a patient. Um, so these large studies are the, are the best we can uh, we, we can look at at the moment. Um, this is from um, UAB um, looking at uh, again um, at salvage laryngectomy and the use of uh, free flap reconstruction in this group again showing a significant uh, reduced rate of fistula compared with the primary closure group. Um, they also um, show the lower rate of stricture formation um, and dependence on feeding tube in the free flap group. Um, so not only showing a, a benefit to fistula, but also with functional outcome as well, um, which is obviously very important in these patients as well and later down the line. Um, the um, significance of the fistula was um, in due with, with peristalty complications as well as length of stay and additional procedures required as well. And that's been taken on more recently with some of the work looking at the functional outcomes of these different flaps. And if you remember before, um, I showed um, that uh, the use of either a pectoralis onlay or free flap in these salvage cases had equivalent fistula outcomes. Well, actually, some of the data is um, trending towards um, showing um, that free flap potentially has great, better functional outcomes for these patients. Um, so um, this important paper um, looked at the differences between um, pectoralis flaps and uh, free flaps um, and uh, noted um, that of the patients who uh, received the, on, uh, the pectoralis flap, um, almost 40% had reduced oral intake compared to those receiving free flaps. Um, the patients reconstructed with um, only muscle flaps um, had less fistula rate than those where there was a myocutaneous component, which is interesting. Um, and harks back to what I was mentioning before about a myocutaneous pet flap not always being the best option for, um, for inset. Um, and they also found a significantly lower number of patients were tolerating an oral diet in the PEC flap group compared to the free flap group and required more interventional procedures, uh, mainly in terms of uh, uh, neopharynx dilatations. And they surmise this may be due to the freedom of movement that free flaps provide compared with the uh, muscle bulk of the um, PEC major. Um, and this um, uh, took that on further, and, and this was a, a, a again a, a microvascular um, large um, a collection of um, experienced surgeons um, looking at a very uh, high number of patients, so almost 500, um, and, and took on that aspect of whether um, muscle was included with reconstruction or not. Um, they showed that the overall fistula rate was almost three times higher with primary composure compared to vascularized tissue um, with, without muscle um, and uh, 1.9 times higher with muscle. Um, so although um, this didn't separate um, between free flaps of muscle and, and pet with muscle, um, it's all trending towards looking at functional outcome for these patients. 
now is um, and these were some of their results uh, so probably easy with a table <clears throat> um, generally showing um, that not only fistula rate is better um, with this vascularized tissue but um, the um, fish uh, the uh, tissue with muscle for um, laryngectomy uh, having a, a lower rate of fissure in, in laryngectomy alone um, and with total laryngopharyngectomy compared with the tissue without muscle. Um, finally, um, this was a very recent paper and it took the aspect of uh, functional outcome uh, a bit further. Um, and they, these authors commented that actually in, in, in much of the literature now, um, although this was done, um, there were people who have often looked at retrospective um, patient reported outcomes, there's been a lack of objective measures in swallowing. Um, and they looked at, at a range of functional uh, swallowing uh, outcomes uh, with both the EAT10 um, uh, functional scores and transit time. Uh, again, looking at both primary uh, laryngectomies and salvage laryngectomies, um, as well as a small uh, proportion of functional laryngectomies, um, and including both primary closure and vascularized tissue reconstruction. Um, and they found that patients undergoing reconstruction had significantly longer transit times um, compared to primary closure. Um, and of those, Importantly, I think the PEC major flap had a significantly longer transit time compared to the, the free flap options. Um, how this translates to a symptomatic benefit for the patient is less clear. Um, but we're gathering, you know, I think it, hopefully it shows a, a body of evidence now that not only with um, uh, patient reported outcomes, but these objective measures of swallowing, uh, free flaps seem to be performing better. Um, than um, PEC flaps for reconstruction um, with the proviso that any bringing any vascularized tissue in is, is resulting in significant reduction in fistula rate, um, in, certainly in salvage laryngectomy. Uh, and this is um, a large meta-analysis um, looking at, uh, I, just, I just wanted to put this in um, to make sure that um, Jejunal free flaps didn't get forgotten. Um, it's, uh, they certainly haven't been used uh, commonly in any units I've been worked in, but um, many senior surgeons will um, talk about their experience of um, days when jejunal free flaps were commonly used. Um, this was a really large meta-analysis that showed um, uh, that uh, the jejunal free flap um, was superior in reducing fistula and stricture rates in uh, uh, pharyngeal laryngectomies uh, compared to free flaps. Um, that they, interestingly, they had they showed that ALT had a significantly lower fistula rate than the radial forearm flap for um, partial defects. Although, um, so the number of the group in the um, radial um, group would have been insufficient to um, insufficiently powered to show this, but. Um, I think it's just important to mention that, you know, in cases where, um, and, and in centers where jejunal free flap is um, a potential uh, option with the expertise locally, um, actually they do very well from a, from a fissure and stricture rate. Um, the criticism around them has often been the morbidity of um, you know, having to enter the abdominal cavity in addition to their other procedures, and certainly um, there are complications from that, although this paper um, discuss that perhaps um, uh, these should be reconsidered in the light of um, um, the evidence they provided. Uh, so that's a, a whistle-stop tour of um, reconstruction ma in major head and neck oncology. Um, I think the points I recommend just taking away from it are um, to make sure you consider patient factors, disease factors, um, and local expertise to optimize patient outcomes, um, to have an active role in the full patient management journey. So that's including ablative and reconstruction. Um, and if you're in NDTs, just have a think about
now decisions being made with reconstruction. It may be personal preference, but it may be an uh, important disease factor, which uh, is worth remembering. Um, offer the best outcomes to your patient by utilizing trained personnel and multidisciplinary team uh, within your MDT. Um, and make sure that you are giving patients a safe and functional reconstructive option. Thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, please ask away. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Jason. Thanks for a fantastic talk. And uh, I think it was really interesting to hear the evidence uh, that you presented and also really lots of fantastic pictures, which helps uh, us to understand the points you're making. Um, so can I ask everyone just to submit your questions via the chat and I'll put them to Jason. And what I'm also going to do is I'm just going to send you a quick feedback form and it will literally take you two minutes to do. Um, so if everyone could just fill that in, uh, that would be really, really helpful. Okay, so we've got a few uh, questions, uh, Jason. So uh, if we can probably start with laryngectomy reconstruction. Uh, so you, you mentioned various advantages and disadvantages of the PEC measure and of preflaps. Um, so can you just tell us what's your approach? In which situation would you use PEC measure? Uh, and, and which situation would you use a free flap for reconstruction? Yeah, so um, everyone uh, tends to be influenced by um, the unit that they trained in. I think that's only natural. Um, so in the US, um, uh, the, uh, we routinely would use a free flap um, for any um, salvage laryngeal or laryngopharyngectomy um, for the reasons I mentioned before. Um, and importantly, um, uh, a major thing behind that was that um, the PEC major was reserved uh, for um, these heart sink cases. Um, so uh, if the patient um, was fit enough to have a free flap, and actually, um, you know, if, you, if you're working units that do them, um, that do them regularly, um, then it, it, there's not really not much time added um, when you work within a very slick team. Um, so yeah, we my my personal preference uh, would be to use a free flap, um, and I think um, you know there's there's more evidence obviously than I could show, but these are the the large studies that I picked out. Um, but there's enough evidence to show that. Um, with either option, you're improving the fistula rate, uh, but with free flaps, you're optimizing uh, the functional outcome. And then in addition, you have the PEC flap as um, uh, a rescue flap if you do develop the fistula, because the fistula rate is still not insignificant, even with the measures I described. So important to have, um, to have that, those, uh, the, the, the PEC major flap as a backup in that case. Great. Um, so, and for those of us who aren't familiar with implantable Dopplers, could you just uh, expand on that? Um, yeah, sure. So, um, uh, the Cook implantable Dopplers essentially um, are a, a device that measures um, waveform of blood through through a vessel. Um, sorry, I haven't got. I didn't have any pictures of it, um, but then you can just see them online. Um, so after you've completed your um, microvascular part of the operation, um, you can, um, they come with essentially a, a, a wrapping bit of, um, a wrap around the electrode, um, and you fit that uh, around um, a vessel um, distal to your anastomosis, and that will then give you um, an audible um, Doppler signal of uh, blood flow. Um, they're still audible, they haven't developed into sort of looking at waveforms and that's probably an area that's under development. Um, classically, they're used on um, the artery. Um, I have seen them and plenty of places use them on the vein, uh, but it is more difficult to interpret uh, if you consider the different waveform. Um, essentially, it's a, um, a, well, it's a low white noise essentially from the vein, um, a very subtle. Um, Doppler signal that you are listening for um, and then when that goes completely then um, you know there's a venous problem so although the, the vein is the most likely thing you can have an issue with um, you have you know, people tend to use it on the artery um, and then that 
is runs out of the wound and connected to a doctor or um, staff on the ward to, to um, uh, confirm um, that the anastomosis is patent and have um, an early warning system um, to alert the um, on-call team who are looking after the reconstruction if there's any issue because um, we know the importance of that is, uh, is uh, a speedy response um, to any concern getting back to theatre um, to potentially salvage any threatened flap. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we've got a question about uh, delayed reconstruction. So um, the question says, you know, I mean, reconstruction is normally done primarily whether, you know, in the same sitting as the primary or the salvage surgery. Are, are there any scenarios uh, in which uh, reconstruction is delayed? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, not so much in the cases of um, laryngectomy defects. Obviously, you can't really delay that mm. um, reconstruction. You may delay it if you have a fistula. Um, and, and certainly you would. Um, so there's a concept of a wound, you know, being ready um, for um, a pet flap, for example. Um, if you have a fresh fistula, there's no point just um, uh, that's, you know, um, cause an active breakdown in the wound. There's no point just sticking up tissue straight away. Um, as long as, um, you know, the vessels are safe, but ideally you need to first divert that fistula, allow the wound to mature and then you can do a delayed reconstruction of that area so that's more in the rescue setting um, but obviously any uh, uh, wound that requires reconstruction um, you can where you haven't got a problem like a um, saliva leaking out um, you can delay that um, delay the reconstruction in those cases it, it's uh, especially I would think you know if you're looking at um, general principles if you've got an actively infected wound um, then you certainly wouldn't want to um, reconstruct that straight away. Um, and other scenarios, uh, for example, um, um, are where you're concerned about your margins or you want to get those confirmed, especially in, for example, you know, skin lesions and those sort of things, they can certainly be uh, reconstructed later. Um, again, there's no point uh, putting a, uh, spending a lot of time on a reconstruction if you're going to have to go and resect more tissue and it makes that process a lot more difficult as well. Um, so whether because of anatomy or a pathology of what you're dealing with, um, it risks positive margins, um, then that's certainly another scenario where you may want to delay your reconstruction. Thanks. Uh, there's a question here about uh, gastric pull-ups. So that was um, being used in some centers for reconstruction. Uh, is that something that's still being done a lot? And what's the kind of general opinion of that uh, approach? Yeah, so I, I'm, I haven't had a huge amount of involvement in them. Um, probably involved in a, in, a, in a small handful of them. Um, it's very select cases. I, I, you know, if you're, you're going to be using a pull-up when your anastomotic line is too low uh, to allow you to, to inset a flap um, safely. Um, so that's when you want to pull up um, to bring... Um, what the inferior edge of your defect into the neck to allow repair. Um, it suffers from the similar um, um, issues with, um, you know, when you're considering jejunal flaps in terms of it being, um, having quite significant morbidity. Um, there, you know, there have been a move to do it, you know, more minimally invasive now, which is certainly a, a progress. Um, but the fact you've got disease going down into the chest, it, it automatically puts the patient at quite a poor prognosis anyway. Um, they almost unilaterally um, develop um, stasis issues, um, reflux issues, um, and that can be uh, very uh, troublesome for patients in the recovery period. So these are all things to think about, but in many cases it's the best option if you think the patient has um, a, a it is a reasonable shot of, of being able to get this disease out, but it's just anatomically or um, just the, the, the size defect you've created is low, too low to inset a flap, then yeah, it's, a, um, it's certainly a viable option. I would definitely try and see one if you can. It's quite something uh, to behold as it's, uh, as it's passed up. Um, but um, yeah, it has its place, uh, but it, as I say, in a, 
select a proportion of patients and then um, have a, you know, you're going to become friends with the general surgical a couple of weeks afterwards as well. Thanks, thanks Jason. Um, and then could you briefly talk us about the management of pharyngocutaneous fistulas, the post -op, so post laryngectomy? How, do you, how are these best managed? Yeah, sure. So um, obviously the best way is to try and prevent them um, from the, um, the methods I've described, um, leak tests at the end of procedures, um, PPIs, you know, minimizing the risk of, um, of uh, vomiting, all these factors. Once it occurs, um, number one is to recognize it early. Um, they are almost certainly going to develop active infection and need antibiotic cover. Um, you can, some people advocate using, um, you know, cholinergic drugs to, cholinergic drugs to reduce saliva. Um, and essentially, number one is to make the patient safe. Um, and that is going to be um, with, if you haven't done one of the techniques I mentioned to try and protect um, uh, the great vessels, and it does, the pattern of the wound does look like you've got saliva running next to um, your carotid, then you need to sort that out. And that's usually with a good washout and a, and a saliva diversion technique, so with drains, et cetera. Um, you need to really keep on top of these patients on the ward round. Um, so don't leave it for other people to do. Um, don't leave it for your poor um, nursing colleagues to do because these um, take uh, regular um, um, and meticulous wound management with um, dressing, so um, you know, regular packing, um, and then as I say, treating any um, complications that develop, especially if you've got saliva or infected material passing near someone's stoma regularly, it's, um, it's quite common with everything going on for chest infections to develop as well. So just keeping on top of them medically, uh, they will uh, suffer from the catabolic effects of this process. So making sure nutritionally and biochemically you stay on top of things. Um, and once you've optimized all that, um, they will settle down. Um, and then when the grant wound is granulating nicely, um, when um, the very active infection has improved, um, then you can consider um, the secondary option of reconstructing it. And that will usually be with a pec major flap. Um, there are some schools of thought that um, you can't ask a, a, a PEC flap to do two things. Uh, so you can either protect the great vessels or you can repair the defect. Um, in reality, I've seen, I have seen them used for both. Um, but using that sternocleidomastoid flap at the time of your surgery works really nicely. I hope you saw in that photo the side where we used it, the vessels were completely covered. So that is one option you can use. And then the pec flap just works really nicely then to help um, close the fistula. And if you've got a, a fistula that's generally the, the um, defect and the opening will reduce in size. Um, and there's a, a Wookiee procedure, it's called actually, um, which is traditionally beside um, uh, old paper where and turn the skin flaps in on themselves and then use the PEC to cover it to reinforce the repair. Uh, so that's how I've um, managed it with the team over in the US when we saw it. Um, but yeah, in summary, um, general management uh, for medical comorbidities, optimize uh, recovery potential, divert, divert saliva and make the wound safe um, and then delayed reconstruction. Thanks, Jason. That's really clear. And I'll probably just ask one final question, um, and that's really about the role of ENT surgeons in reconstruction. So, you know, in the UK at least, uh, we have a fairly limited role in reconstruction, particularly with respect to free flaps. And, and do you think that's something that should change? And do you see that changing uh, over the course of the next 10, 20 years? So you save the best to last, right? Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really good and important question. Um, and 
I think it's important to realize that other countries have very different systems on this. <clears throat> so in the US, um, you know, the eruption that happens in other countries as well. Some countries like Australia a little bit, a little bit mixed, but um, they like us tend to trend towards uh, maxillofacial facial and plastic surgery having um, the prime role in reconstruction. I think the important thing to say is that um, you should only do what you are trained to do. Um, that's a really important point. So um, if you want to do reconstruction, then you should be um, trained in microvascular reconstruction. Uh, that's a given. And there are various fellowships around the world that will allow you to do that. Um, even if you don't end up doing reconstruction, um, then having had training in it, even if it's jumping in when you get a chance locally, is really, really important. It will just give you a completely, uh, people say this, but it is really true, it will give you a completely different insight into vessel handling, um, preparing defects, and really optimizing the outcome for patients. So I really can't, um, can't emphasize that enough. Um, in terms of um, ENT specifically, I think ultimately that comes down to um, the, where you work, um, what historically has been done, or what the local expertise are available to develop. Um, there are a few ENT surgeons around the country doing um, reconstruction uh, because um, they're obviously in the, in the vast minority, but it may be where how the service has been set up locally. Um, ultimately, as much as um, it's sometimes amusing to have these turf war discussions, really, we all want the best for patients, um, and that is done within a team environment. Um, so if you are trained and you're within a good team and there's the opportunity to get involved in it, that's great. Um, but stick to what you're trained in, um, work as a team locally, um, and um, ultimately that's what will give your and you know, the patients within your region the best outcome. Great. Thanks so much, Jason, and thank you to everyone for joining us. So this